Damn it, something's going on, Peggy said loudly next to me. Watching the dance floor, I again wondered what she was talking about. I thought Peggy just talked too much. Everyone was talking about New Year's resolutions. Perhaps the best solution for me would be to stop listening to Peggy and stop communicating with her. I spent New Year's Eve mourning what I had lost. What aggravated my grief was that I myself was to blame for what was happening. My addiction ruined my life just as surely as if I had just given it up. Like a gambler who bets his entire life savings on one roll of a loaded dice in a casino. Just me and Peggy in New Year's grief. In fact, it was her idea to come to this boring party. Everyone around seemed to be laughing, dancing, and talking. They seemed to be having fun too. Peggy and I watched everything from a table at the edge of the room. I would like to say that our table was exclusive. Well, in a way it is. There was no one at our table except Peggy and me. Not that we planned it. It was just that no one was interested in dancing with us or having fun with us. They were more interested in pointing at us when they thought we weren't listening. I was sure that they were whispering about us. How dare we show up here? The party we were at was a huge New Year's celebration for our small town in Michigan. I guess there was a time when I would have really enjoyed this party. There was a time when I would have been among the revelers, wearing my funny hat and holding on to my husband as a lifeline. There was a time when I would pretend to dance among everyone else and scream at the top of my lungs. I say pretended to dance because all I did was move my legs, grinding against Gary as hard as I could. For me, the best part of a party was always what happened afterwards when we got home. Both of our children were born within nine months of the New Year's Eve parties. Marion was conceived in our living room. We couldn't wait to go upstairs. Gary just tore my dress off, and we didn't even close the door. Anyone passing by could see us. And two years later things were even worse with Benny. Gary just pulled me out of the hall and led me to the side of the building. We didn't even go home. God, how I miss those days. My sigh of frustration caught Peggy's attention. I know you hate her, but... Peggy began. Peggy, if you say one more word about this bitch, I'll walk out the damn door and leave you here alone, I interrupted sharply, surprising her with the rage in my voice. I looked across the dance floor at her, but focused on someone else. The one I could never take my eyes off of. The first time I saw Gary was at his company's Christmas party. He was 25 and had just started working as an engineer for the company. It was his first party at the company and he didn't know anyone there. He was so shy and so uncomfortable that I felt sorry for him. I worked as a waitress at a party. My job was to keep a supply of drink glasses for the crowd. Even though we weren't supposed to flirt with clients, I couldn't resist him. At the end of the evening, I handed him the last beer can with what I thought was a dazzling smile. Don't forget to use that napkin, I said. He looked at me as if lost. Luckily for me, I was already on the other side of the room when he discovered that I had written my name and phone number on a napkin. Cool, he shouted so loudly that everyone in the hall turned to look at him. I continued serving drinks as if I didn't notice anything. I saw my boss look at him the same way everyone else did. Maybe we should stop serving this guy alcohol, I said. She just nodded, but I noticed that she had a big smile on her face. Gary's enthusiasm and pure joy were so contagious that they infected everyone around him. Less than a week later, we started dating. In less than a month, we became a couple. Less than a year later, we got married, and every second with him was precious. I often told people that Gary was made for me. He was my perfect match. He was so devoted to me and our children that I was sure that we would never part. Our years together only confirmed that I was right. He was a great father, a devoted husband, and I loved him more and more as time went on. Our life together was happy. We bought our dream home and fell in love with our neighborhood. Our neighbors were wonderful people. Some of them had their quirks, but overall it was a wonderful place to live and a great place to raise children. Hey, Peggy said, do you think I should ask some of the shy guys to dance? Peggy, you are a grown woman. Do what you want, I said. 
It always seems to come out of nowhere, or at least it seems to hit you when you're not looking. It can be trouble, betrayal, pain, or sudden death. It can also be luck or unexpected success. Sometimes it can even be love. I truly believe that I am in love. I have all the symptoms. It's a dizzying feeling when I look into her eyes. That confidence that she is the most wonderful creature that God sent to this earth. That desire to protect her and kill anyone who tries to come between us. And most importantly, the belief that she has the same feelings for me and will never hurt me. I have this in abundance. However, as I prepare to blow her away, I hesitate. Nobody knows what I'm going to do. And even those few who are aware of the place and time of the event have no idea what I have in mind. For the last time I wonder if I should do this. Will this really make everything better? They say it will improve our relationship. I have also heard that it will strengthen our emotional connections, eliminating doubts. My hesitation is not based on any number of doubts, no matter how small, that I am in love. Damn, I'm an expert on love. As I look across the dance floor, my eyes see Carol and her friend Peggy. The slight bitterness still makes me feel sick when I see it. Carol taught me how to love someone. I won't tell you how we met or how our lives turned out. I won't talk about our children, and I won't talk about how we expected to spend the rest of our lives or how we ever planned to spend our retirement years either. Let's just focus on how we live now and how we got here. Carol and I were married for 20 years. This was about two years ago. It was just before Christmas. Carol caught that strange strain of flu that's going around at the time. She was very sick. Naturally, being a devoted husband who worshipped the ground she walked on, I stayed home to care for her until she felt better. Both of our children no longer lived with us. Marion was married and lived in her own apartment, and Benny went to college. Carol took a part-time job working in the administrative department of a local hospital, which is where she likely contracted the virus. While she was sick, she had virtually no appetite. I barely managed to persuade her to try some soup. I used a lot of coaxing and declarations of love, like in teen novels, to get her to at least eat it. I knew for sure that she loved me after all these years. So telling her that if she really loved me, she should eat her soup seemed idiotic and unnecessary to me. But that was what I did. All she really wanted was for me to sit next to her on the bed and hold her hand. The medicine, the doctor told us, would help her recover faster, but would also make her fall asleep quickly. She slept most of the first couple of days. So, like any good husband, in her waking moments, I asked her questions about what she would like to eat. I then snuck out to the market while she was sleeping and bought lots of fresh fruits and vegetables because she seemed to want them. On one of these trips to the market, I ran into Misty Clark. When we first moved to our area, Misty and her husband, Steve, were among our friends. However, it had been several months since I had seen both of them. They seemed to disappear from our social circle. Misty was a small, almost bird-like woman who I never paid much attention to. To be honest, I never really paid much attention to other women besides Carol. But as I watched Misty that morning, seeing her periodically as I moved around the market, I noticed a lot about her. The first thing was that her face was much more attractive than I had ever admitted. Second, for a woman our age, that is, approaching 40 or already in the early 40s, Misty was very well built. I vaguely remembered running into her a few times at local 5K and 10K races, but like I said, we were never the kind of people who socialized much. Her slender, well-shaped calves and muscular legs were highlighted by her yoga pants. Her flat stomach and small but firm breasts could belong to a much younger woman. Carol, on the other hand, was larger. She had big breasts, a big soft ass that I loved to pinch, and thick legs to match. Maybe Carol could lose a few extra pounds, but most of the men we knew looked at her like hungry dogs at a steak. But surprisingly, I found myself sneaking glances at her every time I saw her in the market. Don't worry, she won't talk to you, Sheila Phillips said over her shoulder. Ever since she and Steve got divorced, she hasn't talked to anyone, she continued. I had no idea they were divorced. 
As I continued my shopping, I thought about divorces and how she must feel. I wondered why they separated. I also wondered how this could remain a secret in our small town. Oh, we had a lot of curiosities and oddities, but we were a pretty close-knit group of families. So what happened to most of us was common knowledge. For example, we had a group of people who lived in open marriages. They didn't insist that everyone join them. It was quite random. They dropped hints, and if you shared their views, you could join their meetings. If you weren't ready for casual sex, you simply avoided the bedrooms and stayed on the ground floor or in the courtyard. As far as I knew, it was only for couples and only by mutual consent. That is, no single men were allowed. However, in this case, single women were also not allowed. In rare cases, a married person, with the permission of her spouse, who came with a partner, could also participate. I think this rule helped when one spouse wanted to try something new and the other didn't. However, having permission from the spouse ensured that these actions were unlikely to cause problems. Carol and I were very heavily recruited. We've heard all the usual crap about how sometimes having sex with someone other than your spouse helps spice up the relationship. We have heard of how this has sometimes helped save marriages that were becoming dismal. Another good argument was about how sex, by becoming just a normal human physiological function, completely separate from love, actually strengthened the love between two people. And finally, there was the claim that sex is simply a physical act and does not necessarily have to be about love. I never liked how the word, sometimes, kept popping up in their answers. It didn't sound particularly appealing to me. I laughed at the whole thing and didn't take any of these statements seriously. So after a while, they just realized we weren't interested. Misty and Steve were another couple who didn't participate. I often joked with Carol that she could destroy this club. Honey, if they ever see your breasts, all these guys will fight for you, I told her. They'll have to disband the club. Gary, you're so stupid, she always said. Nobody wants this body but you. I was so absorbed in my thoughts that I didn't pay attention to where I was going. And of course, the person I bumped into was the one I was thinking about. Sorry, Misty, I said. I separated our shopping carts. Nothing, Gary, she said. I know what you're going through. I was lost when I first found out. You know, it doesn't seem like it, but everything gets better. It just takes time. You just have to give yourself time to realize that you didn't do anything wrong. Hold on. If you need someone to talk to who understands what you're going through, call me. She walked away after those words, leaving me standing there wondering what the hell she was talking about. Damn it, said the ever-curious Sheila. For almost a year, I have never seen this woman talk to anyone. What did you say to her? I didn't say anything, I replied. She talked all the time. Sheila, do you know why she and Steve divorced? I have no idea, Sheila said. They kept everything secret. They even hired a divorce lawyer from out of town. She got the house, but that's how it usually happens, I guess. Tell me if you find anything, okay? This conversation with Misty left me perplexed. The whole situation seemed pointless. She was so sweet and so beautiful. I just couldn't think of a single reason why any man would want to divorce her. I returned home to my sleeping beauty. When I arrived home, she was still sleeping. I sat down next to her, but I couldn't stop thinking about that mysterious conversation I had with Misty. The more I thought about it, the weirder it all seemed. A few minutes after I settled into my chair to think about it, Carol woke up. Darling, where have you gone? She asked. Only to the supermarket to buy something for my girlfriend, I said. Your only girlfriend, I hope, she grinned. You always have been and you always will be, I said. This made her smile. I fed her some more soup and she lay down, trying to go back to sleep. Her complexion improved and she began to talk more. This also encouraged me but for some reason, I felt like there was an unresolved question in my head. Carol, while I was at the market, I ran into Misty Clark, I said. Her eyes immediately flew open, and she squeezed my hand tighter. Her body tensed. Suddenly, I became even more wary. Whatever it was, Carol knew something about it. Did you know she divorced Steve? I asked. 
the tension in her body increased even more. Even though she was pretending to try to go back to sleep, I knew her yawns were fake. I just didn't know why. However, I had a feeling. My instinct told me that this was connected with some kind of female feud. Women decide all the time that they don't like other women. And sometimes it's because one woman doesn't like the other woman's friends. I was pretty sure it had to do with Peggy. I didn't really like Peggy either. She was a slut. I hated that Carol was her friend, but I couldn't choose my wife's friends. I waited for Carol to tell me how much Misty hated Peggy. However, she didn't say a word. Her whole face tensed. So what were you and Misty talking about? She asked. Nothing really, I said. I got the impression that she wanted to tell me something, but she didn't say much. Honey, I've heard bad things about Misty, Carol said. I don't know why they got divorced, but I heard that she became unfriendly. I want you to stay away from her. I think she's gone crazy. After a couple of days, when the worst of the flu had passed, Carol seemed strong enough for me to return to work. The office only had a minimal staff to work on projects that were due to be completed early in the new year. I went to lunch alone. My goal was to just grab the sandwich, but that didn't quite work out. I was heading to my car when a woman ran past me. All I saw were long tanned legs and firm buttocks. I opened my mouth in surprise. To my surprise, she turned around, looked at me, and stopped. It was Misty. How are you holding up? She asked. Misty, I don't understand what I need to hold on to, I said. Aren't you divorced too? She asked. Why should I? I asked, confused. Okay, she said. I've already said too much. I'm sorry, Gary. You're a good person. You deserve better. And then she ran away, leaving me standing there in confusion. Throughout the day, I could not concentrate on work. When I got home, I tried to act normal, but I was on edge. I watched Carol's every move. After dinner, I went to the garage to work on my latest project. I did a complete restoration of a 1967 Ford Mustang. My goal was to slightly modernize the body. I wanted to keep the same vibe, but with a more modern take on the classic. Of course, I was also going to completely upgrade the engine and transmission. In addition, I was going to completely redo the interior to make it more modern. At that time, I was still disassembling the car. Normally, I might invite a couple of friends to come and help, but I really wanted to think about it. After half an hour of work, I heard the phone ringing. It rang several times before Carol answered. I would never have thought to pick up the phone. Usually, if someone called our landline, it was for Carol. Whoever called me called my cell phone. It was probably Peggy. She called my wife at least three times a day. I picked up the extension tube and confirmed it was Peggy. The two of them were having a heated conversation. Damn it, how did he meet her? asked Peggy. I have no idea, Carol replied. But under the terms of the divorce, she is not supposed to talk to anyone about it. What are you going to do? asked Peggy. I'm going to call Steve and tell him to put his ex on a short leash. Carol said angrily. This tight ass already kicked us out of the club and ruined her marriage. Now she wants to ruin mine too. Have you thought about my offer? Asked Peggy. Come on, it'll be a one-time thing. There's no way, Carol said. And to be honest, I'm not sure I want that. You think about it, Peggy laughed. Let's talk later. When they both hung up, I was filled with rage like never before. I threw a wrench across the garage. It's good that the garage walls were made of brick. The wrench bounced off and knocked some car wash products off a nearby shelf. Gary, honey, are you okay? Carol called from inside the house. Better than ever, I said, and I meant it. Honey, I'm having trouble unscrewing some parts, I shouted. I'm going to the store for an easy out. I knew she had no idea what an easy out was or what it was used for, or that I already had several of them. Isn't it too late? She asked. Maybe we should wait until morning. AutoZone is open until nine, I said. I grabbed my keys and headed towards the road. I got into my current car, a 2009 Mustang GT. That car was paid off, and since I really liked it, 
I started working on the 67 as a hobby project. First, I drove around the block to check out my neighbors, Chris and Emily Green. They owned the house right behind mine, and we often talked through the backyard fence. They also often jumped over the fence and used our pool. I knocked on the door gently, and Emily opened it. When she saw it was me, she let her robe fall open a little. What brings you here on this beautiful winter evening? She asked, her voice reminiscent of me west. Why don't you just jump over the fence? Um, better call Chris here, I said seriously. She nodded and called her husband. He came down the stairs and we shook hands. Listen, guys, we have been friends and neighbors for a long time, I began. On this basis, I ask you for the truth. Tonight, I overheard a conversation between my wife and her best friend, a local slut, which made me suspect that Carol was a member of your club and... They looked at each other and Emily interrupted me. I thought it would come out sooner or later, she said. Listen, Gary, like you said, we've been friends for a long time. I almost feel like you're part of my family, and I'm really sorry about what happened, but it had nothing to do with us. We're victims just like you. Gary, we have rules designed to prevent things like this from happening. They deceived us and falsified documents. Emily, calm down, I said softly. I didn't blame anyone. I just want to know what happened. Okay, Carol came to see us, Emily said. She told us that there was a cooling off period between you and you wanted a little variety. I was interested because of the thought of you joining us. Well, she told me that she wanted to join, but with a different partner, and that you were completely okay with that. Naturally, I was disappointed. She told us that you were having some problems and that her membership would be temporary while you were undergoing treatment. We've had cases like this before, and this is a really good solution. This way she could try out a lot of different partners and not have to worry about becoming emotionally attached to someone. Our rules prohibit any romantic or emotional attachments. So we gave her a form for you to fill out. I asked her if you would call us. She told me that you were ashamed of this whole situation, but she was confident that you would sign the form. I also asked her to bring a copy of your signature on a check or bill or some other legal document for comparison. But basically, I believed her. After all, we have been friends for many years. We see each other almost every day. The first time she came to one of our parties, it made sense. She was with Steve Clark. Steve has wanted to join us for many years. His wife Misty, on the other hand, was quite shy and avoided us. I'm sure she's a good woman, but from the moment she found out about our lifestyle, she started avoiding us. She acted like I was some kind of slut. So the combination of Carol and Steve, both of whom had permission from their spouses, made sense. Anyway, to make a long story short, almost a year after they joined, I received a call from a lawyer. She threatened to make our activities public and name Chris and I, as well as everyone else involved, in the divorce case. It turned out that Misty not only didn't give her husband permission to participate, but she also sued him for serial infidelity. Your wife also had to be tried for the actions that led to the dissolution of the marriage. We expelled them both and banned them from participating. As far as I understand, nothing came of it. Steve and Misty settled before the case went to trial. She got a house, her car, and a huge alimony payment on top of half of their savings and checking accounts. She also receives half of Steve's pension. And guess what? Her alimony continues until Steve retires or she gets married. Steve also has to pay the mortgage on the house. This bitch got rich. We tried to keep the whole thing as quiet as possible so that no innocent family members were harmed or offended. I think you've noticed that while Chris and I are still friends with you, we barely talk to Carol and never without you. We've heard lately that Carol and her friend have been having a few parties with different single men. Rumor has it that it's mostly Peggy, but Carol is involved occasionally. Gary, I'm so sorry. I nodded. After I had collected myself a little, I looked at her. Um, thanks for your honesty, I said. My calm voice and unwavering gaze were just a mask. I was more furious than I had ever been in my life. I knew what my next step would be, and it wouldn't be pretty. 
I called a friend of mine, Joe Clark. Joe worked for the same company as me. I was a component design engineer and Joe was a CNC programmer. Joe was also Steve's brother. Hey, Joe, I said into the phone. I need to talk to your brother about some of Benny's grades for his senior year. Some of those classes were supposed to count toward college prep. Why the hell should I pay for him to take those same classes again? Gary, I don't need to hear this, he said. I save every penny I can, and I still dread thinking about how much school will cost for my twins. Tell me everything you find out so I know too. He gave me Steve's new address. Hey, Joe, Steve makes good money as a school principal, doesn't he? Why the hell does he live in an apartment? He and Misty broke up a while ago, and she got the house in their divorce agreement. Steve has to pay the mortgage and pay her child support. That bitch really has him down. From what I heard, she just asked him for a divorce one morning. I think she set him up. Ten minutes later, I stood in front of a building that was clearly not the best in the city. The apartments were mainly intended for low-income people who were just starting out in life. They weren't slums. They were well-maintained, and most of the people who lived in them were college students or people who had recently moved to the city and had not yet settled down. I found out what apartment he lived in by looking at the mailboxes. The man coming out of the elevator held the security door for me, and I went up to the third floor to Steve's apartment. I took the stairs two steps at a time, but that didn't relieve the tension I was feeling because of my anger. I knocked on Steve's door. He answered, opening the door slightly. I saw a thick security chain through the gap. Gary, he asked, what do you need? My brother called me and said you needed information about Benny's classes. They were college preparatory classes, he said. They don't give college credit. They don't transfer. Steve, I need you to open the damn door before I kick it down, I hissed. Gary, I'll call the police, he said. Here, I said. Use my phone. I've already dialed 911. You just need to press the call button. But remember, when the police arrive... They'll want to know why I'm here. And when I tell them I wanted to talk to you about why you slept with my wife, I'm not sure they'd want someone like you running a high school and raising all these impressionable kids. It's a small town. Before I could finish, he opened the door. Jesus, Gary, not so loud, he said. Someone might hear. You could ruin my career. You mean the way you ruined my marriage, I said as I entered his small apartment. You mean the way you ruined my life and my children's lives and even impacted the lives of my grandchildren. He just looked at the floor. Listen, Gary, I'm really sorry, he said. But you can't tango for two. In fact, you should be mad at Carol. And your marriage isn't broken. You're still together. You'll be fine. In time, you'll forget everything. Do you know what I'm going through? I'm paying for this. Believe me, I'm paying for what I did. My first blow made his head snap back so that he didn't understand what had happened. The second blow knocked him down. I made a cup of coffee and sat down in a chair to wait for him to wake up. When he came to his senses, I leaned over him. Steve, don't tell anyone what happened here, I said. No one. Got it? He nodded his head weakly. Carol will call you. You won't tell her that I know about you too. Right now she doesn't even know that I know. She will call you to put pressure on Misty. I met Misty at the market today, but Misty told me Carol didn't say anything. When I told her I saw Misty, Carol panicked, and I overheard one of her phone conversations with Peggy. She was talking about us getting kicked out of the local club, so I talked to Emily. And Chris, they told me everything. If you care about your career at all, you should never tell anyone what happened between us. I'll run you out of this town so fast you won't even have time to blink. But as long as you keep your mouth shut, we're done with you, okay? Okay, he muttered. Gary, I'm really sorry. Steve, one more thing, I said. I really need to know. Misty is about five years younger than Carol. She's prettier. She's slimmer. She's... She's boring, he said. I've known her since she was only twenty years old. I was her first. She must have read too many novels as a teenager. She wants candles, cards, and hugs, 
no experiments or other partners. If I even looked at the other woman, she burst into tears. Carol has those big breasts. Misty's breasts would fit in a teacup with room to spare. After sex with Misty, she needed to cuddle for hours, and then she wanted to fucking talk. She is an old woman in the body of a 30-year-old. It's a pity that I even married her. Like I said, boy, I'm paying for it. Then I went home. I went directly to the garage. Carol came out to see what was happening. She hovered around me, wearing only a robe. I had so many thoughts. I was sure Carol was paying Misty some kind of settlement. About eight months before Benny graduated from high school and left for college, Carol took a part-time job. She told me she just needed something to do since the kids had both left home. I often joked about how little she actually earned. However, now that I had all the facts, I was pretty sure that Carol was giving most of her salary to Misty as compensation for the lawsuit. Darling, when will you come to bed? Carol asked. Normally, I would have rushed to her as soon as she said that. Usually, I could barely restrain myself from touching those big breasts Steve was talking about. I'll be there soon, I said. She frowned as she walked back into the house. I stared after her, wondering how stupid I must have been to never notice what she was doing. The next day, I got up early and went to work. Carol was disappointed that I was going back to work. I didn't actually go to work. I left the house at the same time as if I were going to work. I went to a local electronics store and bought a few things. Then I went to visit Chris and M again. I found out the name of the lawyer Misty used in her divorce. I called and made an appointment for the same day. I returned home at lunchtime. I told Carol that I missed her and just wanted to see her. While she was preparing lunch for me, I installed the call recorder I had bought earlier on my phone. I also installed a couple of small cameras around the house. When I left home, I went to the lawyer's office. We had an interesting meeting. Before I left, she told me that she would easily take my case and could offer a discount because most of the legal work had already been done. She also told me that the facts of Misty's divorce, including Carol's role in it, were already part of the court record, so I could easily prove infidelity without much effort. So don't do anything stupid she told me. What makes you think I'd do something stupid? I asked. Two things, she said. You work as an engineer, right? Yes, I said. But that doesn't mean I... So why do your knuckles look all bruised like you're a bouncer? She asked. Okay, what's the second one? I asked. Your look, she said. You look like you really loved your wife and this whole thing has ruined you. It seems like you want to hurt someone for hurting you. In these situations, men need to prove that they are still manly. They do this by beating those who took what was theirs. In your case, you could end up in jail, and in fact, what they got was given voluntarily. I've only seen that look on someone's face once before, and it didn't end there. Fine. When was it? I asked. Misty's, she said. I know it's hard to believe, but she was once a really sweet woman. She was a little shy, but she was sweet. She grew up in the country on a farm. All she ever wanted was to have a man who would love her and who she could love back. What her husband did destroyed her. I tried to be friends with her, but she doesn't talk to anyone anymore. It's sad, really. I know how she feels, I said. Over the next few days, I checked my phone records daily. It wasn't until December 29th that I heard something I could use. Carol, you have to find a way to come, Peggy said. It's going to be special. I invited Fred, Barney, Larry, Shemp, Curly, Moe, and Joe. Even Shemp agreed to come, but he won't be able to stay long. He'll be at Emily's party with his wife. Can you imagine, he'll sneak out of the party to come to our little party. Fred is supposed to bring some guys from work. It would be much better if you were there. Peggy, unlike you, I have a husband at home. I have no idea what we're going to do for New Year's, Carol said. He asked me yesterday if I wanted to go to Chris and Emily's party. It would have been a disaster. Half the people at their club still hate me. Someone could have started talking and I could have lost Gary. The later it would be evening, the more likely it is that someone will get drunk and start talking. We'll probably just sit at home like two old men and watch TV. 
this gave me an idea. The first thing I realized was that I knew all the guys she mentioned. The next day, another fake workday, I put my plans into action. First I visited Fred. I waited until he left his apartment and followed him. Fred worked as a construction worker. He was divorced and also worked as a coach in a local little league. I caught up with him just as he was about to get into his truck. I pushed him on the shoulder, and when he turned to see who it was, I hit him as hard as I could. If I expected a struggle, I was disappointed. Okay, take the money, he said. Only $22. You can have it. Then he looked at me. Gary, what the hell are you doing? I think you broke my jaw, he complained. What did I do to you? How many times, I shouted. Okay, listen, he said. It only happened a couple of times during the season, but it was for the good of the team. If I had let your kid play, we would have lost for sure. A boy can't hit a bus stopped at a traffic light. And you, Gary, have to admit that he throws like a girl. It's not your fault. I'm his damn coach, but I... I hit him with the back of my hand, silencing him. I'm not talking about baseball, asshole, I said. How many times have you slept with Carol? He immediately turned pale. Gary, I'm sorry, man, he mumbled. After my divorce, I was lonely. I was desperate. So I went to Peggy. Hell, I did it on the side. Peggy is the biggest slut in town. Nobody wants anyone to know they're sleeping with Peggy, but half the guys in town have done it. Carol has been there once or twice. She's not like Peggy. She just doesn't let guys kiss her with someone else's wife if he knew that no one would find out. I am, I said. Fred, you have two choices. One, I'll name you in my divorce. I'll smear your name. You'll lose your job coaching your kid's baseball team and any respect you've ever had in this town. Don't forget, your boss, the mayor's brother. Oh, that wouldn't look good on you, would it? His eyes were full of horror at the thought of what I suggested. Or you do exactly what I tell you. You keep telling Peggy and Carol that you'll be at their little party, and you'll do whatever they want. You give me all the information about the place and time of the party. And on the day when that happens, you'll avoid all the trouble I'm going to cause there. After that, I'll forget everything I know about you, and we'll have a clean slate. However, if you warn Peggy, Carol, or anyone else, we'll be at the party, all bets are off. I choose the second option, he said. I'll call you as soon as they give me the details. Gary, can I go to work? I'm already going to be late. I just turned and walked away from him. I caught Barney leaving work that evening. My first blow didn't knock Barney down. In fact, he hit me back. He hit me on the cheek, which made me even more angry. I grabbed his arm as he tried to swing again and threw him to the ground. I think he expected me to try to dive on top of him and start hitting him like they do on TV. To hell with it. I hit him in the ribs as hard as I could. I was sure I heard one or two of them crack. He had trouble breathing and raised his hands. Gary, wait, he said. I've already had one heart attack. I'm breathing heavily. Are you trying to kill me? Can we talk about this? Talk about what? I asked. Come on, Gary. You're a good guy. Don't treat me like I'm an idiot, he said. We've never hurt each other with a word. The only thing that could make you this angry at me is Carol, right? You got it right on the first try, I said. What I don't understand is why, like you said, we were never enemies. And even though we're not close, you're someone I would consider a friend. Why would you do something like that to me? Listen, I know nothing I say will fix this. I'm leaving town. Let me finish the work week, and I'll leave Monday morning. Why are you doing it? I asked. Gary, Carol means nothing to me. It was sex. There's no difference between her and Peggy to me. It was just a chance to satisfy a need. It was very poor judgment on my part, and there's no excuse for it. I'm not married, and after I had a heart attack last year, I felt my mortality. And you married guys don't know how lucky you are. You don't have to wonder where the next piece is coming from. Carol probably has everything you have. You want it when you want it. I've never had it. So I have to take what I can get. But I swear I'll never touch a married woman again. But why leave the city? 
I asked. You were born here. Because every time I meet you or Carol, you will both feel bad, or at least strange. My presence here will create tension in your marriage, he said. I was shocked. Barney was the only guy who expressed any concern about the marriage he helped destroy. Barney, I have a proposition for you, I said. But that doesn't include leaving town. You don't have to worry about Carol and I. We're done. What do you mean, are you done? He asked. He seemed almost as devastated as I felt. Gary, she loves you. It was just sex, damn it. She won't even let anyone kiss her. You have kids. You can't be serious. Is it one of those man-ego things? You don't want her because another man got into her bed, Gary, would kill her. I don't want to be even partially responsible for the destruction of the family. Barney, this isn't about ego. It's about trust. It's about love, I said. I can never trust her again. And I love her. It tore my heart, and I don't know how I can go on with my life. But I just can't see myself with her anymore. Maybe there really is a little ego in it. One of the things that makes us human is a little bit of self-respect or self-belief and that pride doesn't allow me to live with someone who could hurt me like that. He simply nodded and sat with his face in his hands. Damn, Barney, if you want her so bad, you can have her. I'm out of the game. He suddenly looked at me as if I had gone crazy. Why the hell would I want a woman who cheats, he asked. We both suddenly laughed. I explained to him what I wanted him to do, and we parted ways. After that I had one more visit to make, and it was hard. I drove to a house that was just a few blocks from mine. I've driven past this house many times, but this was the first time in a long time that I was this close. I noticed that the house was changing from being a house back to being a home. Home is a place filled with love and hospitality. A house is just a box to store your things. This house has lost something. I knocked on the door, still hesitating whether to stay. Nobody came to the door. I raised my fist to knock again, but decided not to. I was about to leave when the door opened, and she was standing there. There was that awkward silence where neither of us said anything. Then she just opened the door and let me in. After a few stuttered words, the dam broke, and we both poured out our pain in a conversation that only those who had been betrayed by those to whom they had given all their love could understand. We talked about emptiness. She assured me that she never leaves, at least not for her. We talked about the inability to trust people. I've already had this, and my divorce hasn't started yet. Finally, we talked about the need to do something. Making a statement that says, Damn it, I'm human, and I loved you. And you hurt me so much that I can never love anyone again, you bastard. It happened as soon as I said it. The corners of her mouth loosened slightly. Then they rose a little and suddenly it just exploded out of her. A full-blown smile that lit up the room and reminded me that without that seemingly constant serious expression on her face, she was truly a beautiful woman. Misty, I said, you took revenge on Steve. You kicked him out of the house, and he's still paying for it. You took most of his money. He lives in a crummy little apartment downtown. However, how about this to get revenge on Carol, too? I would love to do that, she said, but the terms of my divorce and my civil suit against her prohibit me from telling anyone about the role she played in the destruction of my marriage. No offense intended, but I hate her. I explained my plan and her possible role in it, and she laughed again. That sounds really cool, she said, but how do you know that she will go? She is very careful when it comes to your marriage. On the way home, I was thinking about this very problem. So far, Carol has only expressed the fact that she cannot go to Peggy's party. She insisted that we would probably spend New Year's together. And then I had an idea. I realized that all I needed to do was let what was happening come full circle. Not only would it give Carol the opportunity to go to the party, it would also give me a way to avoid having sex with her until I got rid of her. As soon as I got home, I quietly entered the house and went straight upstairs to bed. When Carol found me, I pretended to be fast asleep. I kept a heat pad under my pillow. When Carol felt my forehead, she said I had a fever. You gave me the flu, I groaned. The next day was December 30th.
I made a big show of calling work to let them know I wasn't coming. I had my iPhone in bed with me. I could access call recording through the app on it. So every time Carol got a phone call, I could listen to it. I recorded and listened to Carol's conversation with Barney, where he told her everything he wanted to do to her. This phone conversation will be used perfectly against her in court, and Barney did a great job with it. He really warmed her up. However, Carol had her limits. Most of the things he wanted to do to her, she said he couldn't do. But she agreed for him to sleep with her first. By lunchtime that day, I knew this would happen. Carol came into the room and handed me a couple of pills. I recognized them as the same ones she took for the flu. These pills could send the average person to sleep for four hours or so. I was sure that she would give them to me the next evening. I pretended to take the pills and Carol watched me like an anchor. She constantly looked at her watch to see how quickly I would fall asleep. Once she thought I was asleep, she called Peggy again and told her she would be at the party, but that this would be the last time she would ever cheat on me. Peggy was happy, but she doubted Carol would ever stop doing this. New Year's and my poor husband was sick as a dog. I felt terribly guilty for what I had planned. One of the things that made my guilt so terrible was the realization that as a life partner, I was terrible. Just a few days ago, I was sick. Gary was with me the whole time. He even took a day off from work. The only time he left me alone was when he went to the market to buy things to make me feel better. His good intentions almost caused my house of cards to collapse around me. If Misty had actually said something to Gary, I might have lost him. I needed to reconsider my life. I've already made my decision. I told Peggy that no matter what happens, this New Year's party will be the last time I ever cheat on Gary. Watching my poor husband lying in our bed made me wonder again why I even started doing this. I told myself that a little variety helped ignite our relationship. After every time I did this, and there weren't many of them, I became insatiable with him. Perhaps it was my mental state, but he seemed to enjoy it. For my part, I believe it was due to guilt. I felt so bad about doing something with someone other than my husband that I just physically had to give him as much sex as he needed. I think it was a mathematical dilution. In other words, the more sex I had with Gary, the less serious my crime seemed. If out of a hundred times sixty were with other men, I would not deserve my husband. I would be a real slut. If it was 5,050, I would still be pretty bad, but not quite as terrible. How low did this ratio have to be before I could consider myself a good wife again? I could never be perfect. Mathematically, the expression, once you cheat, always cheat, makes sense. This means that even after one time I can no longer be a 100% perfect wife. Even if the ratio was 200 times with Gary to one time with someone else, I could never reach 100%. Looking at Gary made me want to cry. I was sure that Gary had never cheated on me. Ever since we first met, all he did was take care of me and treat me like a damn princess. This man worshipped me. Not that I deserved it, but he really loved me. Over the years, while I gained weight, his love remained the same, if not stronger. One day I asked him about this. About two years ago, we had breakfast together. The night before we watched that terrible Victoria's Secret fashion show. Well, we watched about half of it. Gary started rubbing himself against my leg during the show. He was not himself. This was the maximum my husband could dare to do. Initially, I was not in the mood at all. Gary didn't care. I felt bloated and fat looking at all these unnaturally thin. Girls, that's what they were. They could not be called women. Most of them either did not have breasts or they were artificial, alien breasts on a stick. However, watching them jump around the stage in their underwear and those funny damn wings made me feel like an elephant. What are these damn wings for anyway? I just didn't understand. But apparently Gary understood. He touched me everywhere. He touched and kissed me and I knew he was representing one of those models for me probably a blonde with behavior problems who always stuck her tongue out at the camera. And okay, I liked it. But the next morning I needed to know. So, Gary, did you really have that good last night? I asked. 
Which of these girls were you imagining instead of me? I was almost in tears. He looked at me and started laughing. You're kidding, right? He asked. What's so damn funny? I squeaked. I know I'm getting older and fatter. You can't bounce off my ass like a cord anymore, and my breasts are starting to sag. My legs are thicker and... Carol, shut up, or I'll burst laughing, he said. Last night when we were watching TV, the only thought in my head was how lucky I am. Your breasts are much bigger than those women's, and most men will always choose bigger breasts if given the choice. Your breasts are even bigger than when we got married. It's like an investment. You're happier if it grows and becomes more valuable every year. And you know I love your ass. I can barely keep my hands off it. It's big and soft, and I love kneading it. Honey, I hate to tell you this, but you could never bounce off your ass like from a court. You can't do that to anyone's ass. It was proven on one of the human shows on Spike TV. So what got you so excited last night? I asked, wiping my tears. It was when I saw those bony girls on TV that I realized there was a real curvy woman next to me, he said, and she's mine and I can do whatever I want with her. It just drove me crazy. I'm sorry. I snatched the bacon from his hands. You should be apologizing, I said sharply. What you did was just wrong. I thought you liked it after we started, he said sadly. I liked it, I replied sharply. Then why should I apologize, he asked. Because you stopped, I said. I grabbed his hand and pulled him back to our bedroom. Even as the memory grew fainter, I wondered why I did what I did. There was really no reason for this. My life with Gary was as perfect as it could be. I was a fool for risking it, and I knew it. However, even when the rational part of me was spitting out facts and figures, math and logic, I knew I would do it anyway. I was also aware that I might give it up for a while, but eventually I would probably do it again. Cheating is an addictive behavior. It wasn't real sex. Let's face it. I love this man more than I can express. He knocked me out twice. I think the thing about cheating isn't really the sex. The point is that I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. That's what makes it exciting. In our society where everything is possible and very little is actually taboo, I'm doing something wrong. There's also the thrill of knowing that if I get caught, I could lose everything. This is very similar to what players experience. This is the kind of excitement when you literally bet everything you have, every cent you own, on one spin of the wheel. God help me. I spent the rest of the day holding Gary's hand while he slept. God, I loved this man. He gave me his love and affection so easily and completely. I knew that after that evening, I might be able to give it up. I could do anything for Gary. At six o'clock, when it began to get dark, I began to get ready. I made Gary a bowl of his favorite chunky soup and woke him up. I was hoping we could talk a little like he did with me when I was sick. Was it a guilt reaction or something else? Why did I feel so bad? I've never felt this way before, and I've done this off and on for years. And then it came to me. Usually when I cheated, it was on the spur of the moment. Even with Steve, there were times when he would call me, and I would immediately rush somewhere to meet him. This was never planned. We just took advantage of time and availability, which made it all pretty random. But this time, everything was planned. I deliberately planned to leave to have sex while my husband lay sick in our bed. What if there was a fire? What if he goes into a coma from the pills? I just didn't know. However, I was still going. There was no stopping me. Gary couldn't eat the soup. And although he had a fever, he looked terrible. Even without the pills, he could barely stay awake. I feel terrible, he groaned. Sorry, I ruined your New Year's Eve. I started crying right then. I didn't mean to do this. I sat down next to him and turned on the TV. A few minutes later, the phone rang. Hey girl, I'm in the room. Hurry up, come over. Steve, Fred and Barney are on their way. Gary was already snoring. To be sure, I woke him up and gave him a glass of water and two more tablets. He had to sleep until morning. However, I didn't intend to leave for long. I planned to stay at the motel for an hour or so 
and be back at Gary's house by 9 p.m. I didn't change clothes or shower or anything like that. I just took my purse and left. I saw no reason to bathe or dress up for any man other than my husband. Gary received special treatment. No one else received this. I arrived at the motel and knocked on the door. Standing on the street in front of the hotel room door, I felt naked and hoped that no one could see me. My car was parked right in front of the motel. This was another risky move, but I didn't dare park it anywhere else. It was a really lousy area. I could have been robbed or... It was a stupid idea. The door opened, and surprisingly, only Peggy was in the room. I looked around, and it didn't look like a party at all. Peggy was wearing a silk robe and underwear. There was ice cream and beer on the table, as well as a bowl of Doritos. We'll have a good time, she said cheerfully. By midnight, we'll be so exhausted, we won't be able to walk. You mean you will, I said. I'll be home in my bed with my husband by nine. She just smiled at me. You'll change your mind in the process. Half an hour later, we were still sitting, looking at each other. We wondered what the hell was going on. Fred, Barney, and Steve were supposed to arrive early. Finally, at eight o'clock, Mo and Shemp arrived. Peggy caught me looking at her watch. Don't even think about leaving me here alone, she said. There was no love, no care, only sex. While I was watching Peggy, I suddenly noticed something. There was a small rounded piece of glass sticking out of a pot of flowers by the door. He was directed into the room. It could have been a camera. The door opened and all hell broke loose. Two women ran into the room and started screaming. One of them was a very fat woman and the other was typical white trailer trash with heavy makeup. It soon became obvious who they were. Then two more women came in and the screams intensified. The first two women grabbed Peggy off the couch and started beating her. Peggy tried to resist, but there were two of them, and then three. I lost sight of Peggy when the last woman grabbed Larry off me and grabbed me by the hair. I don't know if I lost consciousness for a moment, but suddenly there were four or five policemen in the room. They separated us and took us all to the police station. Judging by the timing of the women's and police's arrival, everything seemed planned. Someone set us up. After receiving medical attention, I was taken to a local hospital for X-rays and subsequent treatment. I was sent back to the police station where I gave a statement about that evening. After giving my testimony, I was placed in a cell. Unsurprisingly, my cellmate turned out to be Peggy. Well, it's boiling, she said. I'm just starting to feel good. Her face was covered in bruises. I just looked at her. Did you tell them the truth? She asked. I just told them that we were having a little party on New Year's and these crazy women burst in and started beating us, I said. Well, that's close enough to the truth, she said. We didn't start the fight and we didn't even have a chance to defend ourselves, so we can't be charged with assault. With luck, we'll be out of here in an hour or so. If not, I'll call Steve and ask him to buy us out. Your husband should still sleep, and I don't have it, so we should be safe. It's like you've done this before, I said. It happened once or twice, she said. Women are so possessive. They get very upset if you seduce their husbands. They act like they own them because he put a ring on them. So how do I explain my face to Gary, I asked. I have an idea, she said. Just tell him I came and tried to get you to go to the party with me. You refused and we had a fight and I beat you up. I won't come visit you for a while and he'll think we're being tolerant of each other. We can't have a friend. However, this didn't work as expected. The prosecutor was very creative. He accused us of using a public or private building for lewd behavior in a place or area that was not zoned for it. This carried a heavy fine or three years in prison. We were scheduled to appear before a judge on Monday morning. Our bail was set at $10,000 each. Steve needed to find $20,000 to get us out. Peggy called Steve, but he didn't answer. When she returned to her cell, she was in tears. It was Steve, I said. He set us up. Did you know there was at least one camera in the room? I didn't notice it until those women burst into the room. 
You know, those women are married to Mo and his friends. They must have been trying to catch one of them or all of them for treason. How did you know Steve was involved? She asked. Camera, I said. Think about it. Steve was the only one who came into the room before I arrived. He set up the camera, and then he never showed up. Fred and Barney didn't come either, she said. He probably warned them, I said. But why would Steve do this to us, she asked. Probably because of the money, I said. After his divorce, all of Steve's money goes to his ex-wife. These women probably paid him to set us up. At this time, an unpleasant man entered the room. Good evening, ladies. I'm your court-appointed lawyer, Herman Weaver. I'm here to offer you a deal. In exchange for not pursuing assault charges against the wives of the men you, uh, got involved with. Sexual intercourse, they agree not to sue you or mention you in their divorce cases. What about the charges against us? I asked. They're not the ones blaming you, he said. The prosecutor does this. Sorry, but this is an election year and he needs to show that he is fighting crime. I am trying to negotiate with him about you. However, he will need something in return. Peggy smiled. Okay, let him come in, she said. I'll take care of it right here, and we can leave. The man looked like he was going to turn green. He looked at Peggy as if she were some kind of disgusting insect. These women have never been convicted of a crime before. They are respected women in the community who have simply taken the law into their own hands. They were extremely emotional and motivated by the preservation of their marriages and families, he said. Regardless of your decision, they probably won't see jail time. Judges are sympathetic to cases like this. They will most likely receive community service. Your help in this may make the judge more favorable to you. But I'm also married and have never committed a crime. I said. In fact, I need to go home. My husband is very sick and home alone. However, you were in a hotel room having sex with several men, he asked. I felt terrible. I'll be back in a few minutes. You need to think about what you want to do, he said. I moved to the other end of the room from Peggy. I was willing to do whatever it took to get out of jail before Gary woke up. This incident was a wake-up call for me. I'm done with cheating. A few minutes later, Mr. B's Weaver, I mean Weaver, returned. He brought two women with him. One of them was the woman who beat me. Her tears flowed. Her makeup was smeared. She slouched and could not look me in the eyes. I expected her to apologize, but she didn't. I looked at her hands and her nails were freshly chipped and cracked. Her knuckles were badly beaten. This woman was clearly not a fighter. She was also physically smaller than me and looked very graceful. Don't you feel guilty about the way you beat me? I asked. I've never been in a fight in my life, she said. Her voice was quiet and squeaky. How long have you been having sex with Larry? She asked. Don't you understand that we have children? You're destroying the family. She started crying again. She clearly loved him. I took care of him for over ten years. I gave birth to his children. I wash his clothes and cook his food and take care of him when he is sick. But he sneaks up on you. She rushed at me and Weaver had to intervene between us. I felt sorry for what I did to her. I'm sorry I had sex with your husband, I said. She looked at me. It doesn't matter, she said. She looked like a balloon from which all the air had been released. I loved him with everything I have, but I'm clearly not enough. You can take him. I made my choice. If you drop the charges against me so I can go home to my kids, Larry is yours. I don't want Larry, I said. Tonight was the first time I saw him. I have a husband and children. I just wanted to spice up my marriage. If you answer a couple of my questions, I'll drop the charges. What do you want to know? She asked. Oh, wait, sign the paper first. Weaver handed me a document, which I scanned and then signed, but held on to. I could hardly believe that the woman didn't trust me. I guess I deserved it. How much did you pay Steve to set us up? I asked. Who is Steve? She asked. The same thing happened to all of us. Earlier this evening, a woman called and said that if you want to catch the woman your husband is having sex with, come to this address. 
I took a pen, wrote down the address, and came. I don't know anyone named Steve. I was stunned. It had to be one of the other wives. Weaver came up to me and said I was free. How? I asked. Someone paid your bail, he said. What about me? Peggy screamed. He shook his head. Get me out, Carol. I'll get you back, she screamed as I walked out the door. I spoke to the policeman at the counter. Who paid my bail? I asked. I thought it had to be Steve. Maybe he didn't want to deal with Peggy, but he and I had history. When the woman gave me my wallet back, I told her to release Peggy using my credit card. There's a problem with your card, she said. She says to contact your financial institution. I gave her another card, but the result was the same. Don't even ask, she said. We don't accept checks. I walked out the door to find a small woman in a beautiful dress waiting for me. She seemed familiar, but I couldn't remember who she was. Wait here, she said, and then walked away. She returned to the front, driving my car. She came out and walked towards me. She was thin, but shapely. The dress was a beautiful, iridescent shade of blue that matched her eyes. Her long legs were so toned that she didn't wear stockings. Their healthy shine radiated right up to the extremely high heels on which she balanced precariously. Despite everything Gary said, I would die to be built like her. Then I recognized her. Misty, I said. Why did you ransom me? Just helping a friend, she said. But I, I thought you hated me, I said. I hate it, she answered coldly. You're not that friend. I like that. She handed me a stack of papers. I'm not a bailiff, she said. So these are not official documents. They are only copies. Please note, however, that the restraining order in the stack is real and will be enforced. You are prohibited from coming within 500 feet of Gary's home, his place of employment, and his person. He wants nothing to do with you in general. Any contact must be through your lawyers. All your belongings and personal belongings are in the car or in the trunk. There is enough gas in the car to drive you to your parents' house in Ohio. These documents will be delivered there by courier in two days. I was told to tell you that he loved you more than anything in his life. He will leave it up to you to decide how to tell the children the reason for the divorce. But if you lie to them, he will tell them the truth and he has proof. Now he arranges a line of credit for you which will be deducted from the final payment amounts. I was told to tell you to drive carefully, but I don't care. He even bought you food in case you got hungry. I ate your fries, so sue me. Oh yeah, if you miss another payment on your settlement with me, I'll drag you to court and you could go back to jail. I was shocked. It was so stupid. I should have expected this. I always knew what would happen if I got caught, but the pain I felt was off the charts and everything she talked about. My parents will find out. My children will know. I never thought about all this, and she said he had proof. Then it dawned on me that it was a video camera. It wasn't Steve who set us up. It was Gary. So you got your revenge, huh? I told her mockingly. I used your stupid husband, so you used mine. I never tried to ruin your marriage. I didn't want that. You ruined your marriage. So Steve needed a little variety. He told me you were terrible in bed. If it weren't me, it would have been someone else. You're lucky it was me. I didn't want Steve. You ruined my marriage for nothing. I just collapsed there on the steps of the police station. Her voice sounded as cold as ice. I never slept with Gary Carroll. I was in love only once, and you ruined it. Gary and I are not, and have not had any relationship. The information about my divorce and your role in it did not come from me. As far as I understand, Gary told you about our chance meeting at the market. Like any good husband, he immediately went home and told his wife. You then got excited about our chance meeting and told everything to your friend. Gary accidentally overheard your conversation, then he went and beat up Steve, who probably told him everything. He ran all over town catching your lovers while he was setting this up. Gary understands my pain. He knows what it's like to lose someone you love because of his own selfishness. So, knowing that, he offered me the opportunity to get this little revenge, and I took it.
She walked away, and a car I knew all too well pulled up to pick her up. My heart broke as I watched Gary's car carry the woman who had just destroyed me into the night. Gary, why did you want me to wear this dress to deliver the divorce papers? Misty asked. Because you look stunningly beautiful in it, I said. I hope that giving you a little of what you got will make you feel better. I know the pain probably won't go away completely, but I hope it will make you happier. It really is, she said. More than you think. What do you mean I'm beautiful? I don't have breasts. Misty, a woman is more than just two piles of flesh on her chest. And this dress is perfect for the party we're going to, I said. We pulled up to my house and walked around the block to Chris and Emily's house. Gary, I can't go in there, she said. Misty, we'll just come in for a while, I told her. When you want to leave, we will leave. Emily met us at the door. She was glad to see us. Misty was shy at first, but I held her hand, and she gradually relaxed. An hour before midnight, Emily came and picked her up. They went to the kitchen and talked for a long time. I saw them from the living room where I was sitting waiting my turn on the Xbox and talking to some of my friends. No one in the city yet knew what happened to Carol. There were couples and groups leaving the living room to retire to one of the rooms on the second floor, but no one cared. In most cases, these people did not leave with those they came to the party with. However, it didn't matter. The biggest surprise was that a little later, after Misty and Emily had left, a woman I barely knew approached me. Gary, you're not here with Carol tonight, she said. Does that mean you're free? Everyone will probably find out soon, I said. Carol and I are getting divorced. Then you probably shouldn't be alone, she said. And he's not alone, Helen, Misty said. She came out from behind me and took my hand possessively. And he's not available, but thank you for being woman enough to just come up and ask instead of sneaking around like some slut. It was the longest anyone had heard from Misty since her divorce from Steve. Across the room, I saw Emily giving her the thumbs-up sign. We were inseparable for the rest of the party. Everyone asked us about us. We constantly told them that we were just friends, helping each other get through bad relationships. Men approached Misty asking her to dance, and she politely declined. I did the same, but we danced together. Our dances were very modest. There was a lot of space between us. At midnight, as we watched the big ball fall on the big TV screen, Everyone there kissed the person next to them, regardless of whether they came together. Helen stood next to me until Misty stood decisively between us. Don't even think about it, she said. When the countdown began, I felt uneasy. We don't have to, I began. I haven't been kissed in over a year, she said. Misty, I don't want to spoil anything. I began. Shut up, Gary, she said. She grabbed my head and gently pulled me towards her. Our lips met, and it seemed that time had stopped. I even felt dizzy when we stopped kissing. I couldn't believe that less than an hour after sending my cheating soon-to-be ex-wife out of town, I was kissing another woman. News of my divorce, as well as that of Larry, Moe, Curly, and Shemp, spread through the city like wildfire. Both Carol and Peggy received six months in prison and a year of probation. The prosecutor wanted to send a message that any crime would be convicted in our city. It did not help. He lost the election for re-election. Because of her criminal record, my evidence, and her involvement in Misty's divorce, the judge gave me our house, 50% of our current assets, and a minimum of two years of child support. I put all her money into an account for Carol and gave it to her through her parents when she got out of prison. For some reason, Misty and I remained close. We were supposedly just helping each other through the pain of divorce. We spent a lot of time together. It's been a very busy weekend for us. She would come over to help me clean my big house, and then we would go to her house to do some gardening. After that, we went to dinner or took a walk. In winter, we stayed at home and watched movies. We never had any problems and Misty was, without a doubt, the sweetest woman I have ever known. Even my children accepted it. God, some guy will be happy to be with her someday, I told my daughter. I think Misty heard it because her smile lit up my backyard. 
Guys always ask me about her, and I told them we were just friends. I was so tired of guys hitting on her and interfering with our communication that I finally told her that she was over her divorce and maybe should consider dating one of those guys who constantly harassed her. So, do I have your permission to date? She asked. I just nodded. Do you mind if I do things with him and maybe spend the night with him? She asked. I was annoyed, but knew I should start dating too. It's been a year since my divorce and almost three years since hers. Misty, you're 35 years old, I exploded. You don't need my permission. Gary, you saved me, she said seriously. If it weren't for you, I would still be alone and never leave the house. I would have no friends, and everyone in town would still call me that strange woman. I owe you so much that I don't want to offend you. But like you said, it's time. I haven't had sex in years, and... Damn, Misty, you don't have to just rush out there and start. I started. She laughed. So, Daddy, I can date, but I can't have sex, huh? She laughed. Well, I talked to Emily and she. Do what you want, I said. She grabbed my hand as I tried to leave. Gary, I'm not like that, she said seriously. I won't just go to bed with someone. I need to meet them and get to know them first. I need to make sure we have the same views on romance and love. I'm not interested in casual sex or recreational sex. I'm not Carol. I'm sorry, Misty, I said. You have the right to be happy. I guess I was a little jealous. She grinned. Were you jealous? She laughed. We can't even go to a party without getting four or five proposals from women. Do you want to meet him? Meet who? I asked. The guy I'm dating, she said. Actually, no, I said. Why? She asked. Don't tell me we won't be friends anymore just because I want to start dating. Misty, this guy doesn't want me around, I guarantee you, I told her. He'll just have to deal with it, she said firmly. She grabbed my hand and led me to her couch. She took out her iPad and opened her photos. There was a large folder called My Best Dates. I looked at the photos and most of them were pictures of places around the city, many of her alone. Where is your boyfriend? I asked. He took these photographs, she said. There's a really hot photo of us together at the end. Hey, we were there, I said. Yes, I liked it so much that I asked him to take me there too, she said. Hey, I know this photo, I said. I made it. I didn't feel comfortable, so I deleted it. You made it on my iPhone, not yours, she said. My phone sends every photo I take to the cloud and to my iPad and computer. Why did you feel guilty? Because it shows your butt and legs in those little shorts, I said. I didn't want anyone to see. It's weird, she said. He likes my butt, too. I always wear these shorts for him. Steve didn't like my butt. Steve was an idiot, I said. I put down the iPad. Come on, Gary, I like looking at photographs, she said. I can't, I said. I don't want to look at pictures of you and some fucking asshole. He hasn't even known you that long, and he's already making you show off my, I mean, your butt for him. I never asked you to wear those shorts. And, Gary, obviously we can't be friends anymore, she said. Apparently, there are some unresolved issues between us. Emily thought that might be the case. You're probably right, I said. I'll find my way out. She seemed glad to see me go. My heart was in my throat. Gary, God, you're stupid, she said. She jumped between me and the door. Gary, look at this damn photo, she screamed. This was the first time we had a serious fight. She shoved the iPad right in my face. That's the wrong photo, Misty, I said. I know you think I'm stupid, but this is a picture of you and me, not you and Mr. Manny's lover shorts. That's the right photo, Gary. Why do you give yourself such a stupid nickname? She said. I, I said. Is it me? Am I this guy? She simply nodded. So you like my ass, huh? I simply nodded. Gary, did you mean what you said? What part? I said a lot of stupid things, I told her. Well, you didn't actually say the words, but you hinted that you, uh, loved me, she said. I am to some extent really, I said. 
and then suddenly her iPad fell to the floor and she found herself in my arms. Damn it, I was waiting for a kiss like it was New Year's at Emily's house, she said. That was over a year ago. I wanted to take things slowly because we've both been through a lot of terrible things, I said. God, Gary, the glaciers are moving faster than you, she said. That's why I had to do this whole dating thing. Emily said if I didn't push you, we'd never leave the friend zone. It was your daughter who gave me the idea of how to do it. She kissed me again. That bitch Emily was so good at throwing parties that she was now throwing holiday parties for the whole damn town. It was really strange that a woman who threw debauched parties at her home was respected in a city where Peggy and I were outcasts. Over the past year and a half, I have tried my best to fix my marriage. Hell, I started doing this back in prison. I wrote a couple of letters to Gary and gave them to the kids to pass on. As soon as I left, I went to him. I wanted to talk to him and try to explain. I wanted to at least apologize. I approached my house on Saturday morning, just a few hours after release. I knocked on my own door, and to my surprise, the little bitch opened it. Carol, she said. Misty, I answered. Escaped from prison, she asked. They released me, I said. Restraining order, she said. Expired, I said. Oh, she said. And you, I asked. Helping with cleaning, she said. Why, I asked. He's a terrible cleaner, she replied. This place really needs a woman. Why do you, I insisted. We're friends, she said. We help each other get through divorces. Bullshit, I said. You want him. I kind of got it, she chuckled. Before I could think of a response, she closed the door in my face. I expected to come in and start a conversation. I expected him to call me a couple of chosen words, and then I would become very contrite and apologize over and over again. Then we would start a real conversation. The conversation would lead to sex and my marriage would go back to normal. I left home confused, tired, and irritated. But I was determined to return him. Over the past year and a half, I've tried more plans than coyote chasing beep beep. None of them worked. The closest I came to this was during my hospital stay. I was poisoned. I must have eaten something I'm allergic to. Anyway, I woke up in the hospital and Gary was there. For three days in a row, he sat with me throughout the visitation period. We could talk. He even invited me to stay at his home for a while after discharge. All this made me think that we still have a chance. This never happened. Small Blonde came. She actually told me that she hoped I would get better and brought me a card, flowers, and magazines. While Gary went off to ask for something for my flowers, we talked. It won't work, she said. What? I asked. I told him I don't mind if you stay with him for a while, she said. He moved on. He forgot about you. So he even forgot that you were allergic to seafood. How could you know? I started. Marianne told me at a barbecue by the lake. She wondered if her children would inherit your allergies. They tend to skip a generation. So go ahead and try it. He won't bite. Gary's not a cheater. He loves me. So your big breasts and that a fat ass will only make him appreciate what he has more, she said. At least try to leave with dignity. You have children together. Your scheming to cheat on him cost you your marriage. Don't let further scheming turn you into someone he can't stand to be in the same room with. Gary came back with what must have been a joke. It was the ugliest pottery I've ever seen. See you later, honey, she said. She stood on her tiptoes and kissed him. And it wasn't just her kiss. He, too, disappeared into this kiss. Their bodies seemed to melt together as if they were made for each other. Just watching them kiss made me feel like I was watching someone having sex. My husband has really moved on. It also made me realize that Gary and I are just different. We have different ways of loving. Gary and this baby only loved one person, and they loved that person with all their being. They were simply unable to have sex or even kiss anyone else. Sex for them did not just accompany love. He was literally in love. Steve and I had no chance of getting them back. None of them would ever forgive the one who betrayed them. If she died, I still wouldn't have a chance with Gary. 
I left the hospital and have tried to live my life ever since. It's a small fucking town, so I saw them a lot. They were so cute together, it drove me crazy. She basically moved into my damn house with him and gave Steve his house back. Yes, that's it. She didn't sell the house and keep the money. She gave it to Steve. She also allowed him to reduce the amount of child support. She said she was happy and thought Steve had already paid enough. Peggy and I became outcasts in the town where we were born. It bothered me, but Peggy didn't care. Peggy always landed on her back. No, not on her feet, on her back. And she liked it. She has been acting very strange lately. She thinks we need to move to another city. There just aren't enough men out there who are still willing to have sex with her. And now I found myself at this boring party, watching a nightmare unfold right in front of me. It was just before midnight, and the start of a new year was full of possibilities. However, there was no possibility for what I wanted. And then Gary did it. He got down on one knee, and everyone held their breath, waiting. They were waiting. She looked across the floor and saw me. For a moment our eyes met. What the hell? I nodded to her. And then, in the thin, squeaky voice of a smurf, she told him, Of course yes, it's time. They kissed, and the entire city community exhaled unanimously. The countdown reached midnight and everyone around was happy. I needed to get out of there. Hey, Carol, do you want to dance? Someone asked me from behind. I turned around and saw Steve in front of me. I'd prefer sex, I said. No strings attached, he said. No romance, I said. No emotion, he said. No relationship, I said. Can we just go and do this already? Asked Peggy, who appeared upon hearing the word sex.